Okay, so now we're talking about plating of the barrels. And all right, so like I said, I don't know which came first. I honestly think it was the repair process. And so what would happen is a, as a barrel would wear out, I, I could be wrong on this, but I believe what they were doing during World War II in that time frame is they weren't boring them over. And they get, because when you bore it over, now you need a P whatever piston, P10 piston, you need different size rings and all that. Well, if you just bore it over and then chrome plate it back to standard, then you just use the same size piston and everything. So I think that was how it started. But then, as I can imagine, they kind of realized that, hey, this stuff isn't corroding. That's pretty cool. So then that became, at one point, I remember being an option. It's like, hey, I want my brand new engine with chrome on it. And so, because it doesn't rust, you just leave it, it's fine. Of course, you cannot use what kind of rings? Chrome rings. Chrome. Use chrome rings. So, but it's, it's called cracked chrome or channel chrome. So I'll kind of hand this around. Kind of hand it around, I will hand it around. A couple things to note. One, you can see all the channel chrome in it. Two, at this end where the threads are, you can see how badly it's worn. Where the, the ring would have went up there. It's, it's uh, not at the top top, but before. It's kind of followed up and you see that the channeling is kind of worn away about an inch down. And so that's where it's just kind of wore out. Now when the channeling wears away, then it becomes very slick and then the oil gets by. The channeling is to hold oil. So if you don't get any oil up there, it doesn't want to do it. And then over here you can see where it actually wore through the Chrome. Why can't you have both chrome? You have a chrome ring and a chrome finish. The two chromes want to eat each other up. Uh, they hate each other. So if you have like chrome, uh, chrome plating, and you have have to use regular steel rings, cast iron rings, or cast iron, um, would those still would those be basically the only thing that would uh, tarnish or or uh, corrode? I never, I don't think there was much of a problem. It's such a small surface area that I don't think it's a big deal. Because if you think about leaving an airplane just sitting for months or years on end, the piston doesn't, you're not supposed to move the piston, so you have huge spots in there that are gonna corrode, and then you have problems. Uh, I meant to ask you earlier, but how hot did it have to be for you to actually unscrew the part? As hot as we were getting those Take it. Yeah, because I've actually been working on this. Started to twist on me, like, oops. All right, so plating. We had the chrome. And then there were companies that tried some new stuff. And this is kind of going by memory. They had the, the ceramic. Ceramic, yeah, what would we call it? Um, Sermachrome. Sermachrome was a big deal. It says chrome was ceramic, and you had to have remember anymore if we use special rings on that or not it was kind of a disaster uh, it did not work real well I remember that we had built a couple of engines using this stuff and you could actually when after it ran its initial run-in you pull the dipstick out or look at the oil it had a film on top of it which I don't know what that was um, ceramic then they then they started using um, nickel They called it Sermonil, C-E-R-M-I-N-I-L. And I want to say that was uh, ECI's baby right there, Sermonil. What did we call this ceramic? Um, I may not be spelling it right. C-E-R-M-I, Sermonil. I don't think that's right. It's Sermonil. That's how we pronounce it anyway, Sermonil. And these all had uh, color coding. So this was uh, orange, had an orange. Do I have that on here somewhere? Yeah, let's write it. And when you did that, you had to identify the cylinder. So let's take a look at that cylinder on the painted side. What, what colors you got? There you go. That is orange. Orange. So orange. This was two orange. O R A N G. Two orange bands. So you just orange and orange. You had to have a space in the middle. And this one was um, two teal bands. That's blue, but it was kind of a teal, teal bands. I had a very unpleasant uh, day with some Sermonil one time. I had uh, Sermonil cylinder in the oven, and uh, you know 
know, heating it up to do guides and seats. And I heard kind of a weird noise. I looked over at the oven and all the sermon notes were just falling out <laughs> on the floor in a pile. So I called the ECI. I'm like, uh. <laughs> they said, yeah, you can't subject that stuff to an open flame. Is that not what is happening? That's kind of what I thought. I'm like, okay, so just sleeve it. Like, yeah, so, you know, I had a, a, a sleeve of aluminum I would slide in there. So I'm like, okay, if it's not supposed to be an open flame, I don't know how this. I, I did not enjoy Sermon Hill at all because I had a really cool hone. Oh, man, what I wouldn't give to have that thing now. It was the coolest damn hone. And we couldn't use it on the Sermon Hill cylinders because we had to use just an old timey like one that goes in a drill. I didn't even show you guys to use it because it used diamonds. So it was a diamond coated uh, hone that you just had to do by hand, which I didn't appreciate with uh, some special cutting oil. But anyway, so those were the ones. Um, so I got characteristics of plating. Characteristics of plating. Uh, let's see. Some good, some bad. Number one, no rust. Probably the best one. Uh, great wear. They don't wear, it's really hard. Um, they were difficult to break in. To break in. So you talk about engine break in. And what that is, is steel parts that rub, or parts that rub on each other need to wear in. Well, um, and I think of like rocker arms sliding across uh, valves and stuff. You know, that's one thing, you're gonna give off some metal. But when you're talking about true break-in of an engine, you're talking about really the cylinder wall and rings. And in theory there, if you had the cylinder wall, well, if you look at it really carefully, it's got huge ridges built up into it, you know, various different heights and whatnot. And it, we actually, when we hone it, we put in a crosshatch pattern of a certain RMS finish, that's root mean square finish, which is, I think, 0.45 root mean square. And you would measure this with a profilometer, which is basically like a record needle kind of a thing that we go through. And, <laughs> I didn't have one of those. I just used a, a comparative card, which works too. And you can look at it. So I'd have this calibrated little wallet that I'd open up and it would have finishes on it, metal finishes. And you'd say, okay, well, this one's really polished. And you would look at that and go, okay, that matches that. So that's my finish. Or you'd have one that's kind of rough. You could feel it. And you'd look at your cylinder and go, okay, that was, you know, match it. So you'd have a certain roughness. And the idea is you have your rings that are going across it. And of course, rings also have little ridges built into them. And you don't want all of these ridges, you want it to wear in. So when you wear in a cylinder, in a sense what you're doing is you're knocking down these ridges so that they're more flat. And you, you, you want the, some ridges in there so that they're more flat. And you still have the ability, oil can be green, it holds some oil in these, these open areas, but you've knocked off all of the high spots. And so when your ring is coming Cross it, it's much smoother. So that's breaking in. So we had a hard time breaking in these cylinders because they were so hard. Or if you didn't do it right, you kind of blew it. What can happen if you don't break in an engine properly, whether it's broken or not, you're going to get the oil is going to fill up these areas. And when oil reaches a certain temperature, it's going to coke. And that means that it, it turns into like a varnish, very hard varnish kind of a surface that you just can't get out. And so when you get this coked surface, then it would be like having a chrome cylinder with no channel cracks, just a smooth sheet. And then oil can get back and forth really well. And so you burn a lot of oil and you don't get good um, sealing between your rings and the wall. If you don't get good sealing between the rings and the wall, you have high temperatures. And so the whole thing can be all bad. So they were a little difficult to break in. In talking with some pilots who we had, were breaking in like Sermonil or stuff like that, uh, this is before I was doing the engines. And the process was they would just build the engine, bolt it to the plane and you know do a ground run and then just give it to the pilot and say, all right, go fly. You know, and uh, a little dangerous, and that doesn't count as testing per the manual either. Anyway, but it was interesting to, you know, 
talk to these pilots and they would go flying and the ones that had instrumentation would say, you know, I took off and the engine was really hot and it got hotter and hotter. I climbed and the thing is they would tell them don't climb real high because you need the pressure on the rings and you get pressure on the rings from having high power settings at high manifold pressure. Well, in a fixed pitch propeller, the only way you can adjust your manifold really and keep it high is to stay low, right? Well, in any engine, I should say. It's not turbocharged. So it's say stay low, which is dangerous in a new engine. And uh, don't baby it. I mean, just go. You know, 75% power or more. Just flog this thing. It's a man, you just watch the temperatures go up, 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 up. And then you'd see it stop and they go down, 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 down. And that was breaking. Oop, there she's done. And some people say it'd take about half an hour or so and they'd see that happen. And there you were. Yeah, they didn't even talk about breaking in car oil. And she's like, ah, it's fine. I remember I looked at a car. I mean, I was a kid. I'm like, yeah, what's the breaking on this? Oh, there's no breaking. They're fine. <laughs> um, they had oil consumption issues because of that. Um, some of them need special rings that you can only get from that particular manufacturer. So. They had some problems. Not aware of a lot of major problems with just the good old fashioned cracked channel chrome. You know, they just kind of worked. Um, all right, so number two. Uh, no, not number two. C. <laughs> non plated bores. So back to non plated. Uh, can be bored oversized. Not all of them. Um, some higher horsepower engines, they did, do not want that to happen. Because the problem is, when you're talking about boring something oversized, well, you can't bore oversize a plated cylinder. They don't make P10 chrome or P10 sermonel. Or it's just they're standard. So if it's chrome or any kind of plating, it's standard. <clears throat> End of story. Um, so when you're talking about boring a cylinder oversize, you're talking about, you know, taking it from standard to plus 10 or to plus 20 or 15, depends on the engine manufacturer and the model, what, what you're going to do, but they're nitrided cylinders and the nitriding is how thick? About 0 0.010. 0 .010. And the next bore size over is always going to be 0.10 over. So what have you gone through? You've gone through the nitriding. They're no longer nitrated. They're plain steel. They don't call them that, but let's just be honest. We know it. You bored them oversized. The nitriding is pretty much gone at that point. Um, plus, to be quite honest with you, cylinders, they're, they don't have a long life expectancy. And so by the time you've taken a cylinder and you've worn all the way through the original bore to the point where you're like, man, we're going to go oversized on this thing because they're so big. That's, that cylinder's tired. The metal is fatigued. They're prone to cracking if they haven't already cracked. Uh, it, it's just, it's time, you know. Hang it up, make a necklace out of it, planner or something, I don't know. It's not, but I did it a lot, so, you know. I'll tell you now, but when I was making a living doing it, that's a great idea. Making uh, me board oversized, usually 0 .010. Um, and 0 0.020. Man, if you're going 10, then you wore through the 10, you're into the 20. It's like, wow. Um, TCM or Continental, because I don't want to spell Continental, uh, at least when I was doing this, has a P005. So um, it used a, used a standard, standard is STD, standard piston with plus 0 0.005 rings. And honestly, anytime I was using an older cylinder, a cylinder that was serviceable, I should say, I always ordered the P5 rings because the standard rings would give me too big of a gap. And so I'd use the P5 rings, then custom gap them down. And it gave a nice tight seal. So, um, I don't know. What can you go over in a car? Hmm? Say again? Car. You can bore cars over quite a bit, right? Yeah. How big? Uh, very. Uh, I'm, I'm not too sure exactly. You know, it depends on what you're building it for. Most people will just change up the crankshaft and just make a bigger bore or a bigger stroke. All right. So, uh, boring oversize is limited to less than autos because 
our cylinder walls are much thinner. So that's why you just got pretty much 10 and 20. I really think there's a 15 in there too. All right, two, two types. Two types of bores. What are the two types? Well, you got your plated and your non-plated. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. You got your straight bore and your choke bore. So straight. The straight bore. And we got the choked bore. And as I said before, we're talking about what happens to this the cylinder walls. And yeah, because there's more mass up here, we choke them. And then when the cylinder heats evenly, then it's a straight bore. Well, they also made just straight bore cylinders. So if you measure it, uh, your guys have your 290 should be straight bore. You measure them, it's pretty much straight all the way through, right? Just for the most part, were they tapered? Choked. Were they choked? Yeah. By how much? Like maybe one to two thousandths? Yeah, yeah, if it's one to two thousandths, it's just, yeah. it's just incidental. It wasn't a choke cylinder. The choke cylinders, when they first came out, they were 12 thousandths. And then that got reduced to about six or seven with the uh, steel belted. So straight bore. So this means the diameter, diameter at top is same as diameter at bottom. Then we have the choked. Choked. Diameter. Do I need to stop? What's going on over here? I'm trying to figure out your. Because I went back to the original layer. If I just put a. Notes, I know, but now you're dragging me down. I'm not just trying, put a freaking star or square or circle or. Yeah. Now you're missing the point because you're so worried about that. But that's a you problem, to be honest. So, uh, diameter head. Tell it's my problem. So, diameter at head is smaller smaller than diameter diameter at opening or the skirt choke is about <coughs> 0 0.005 to 0.010 and as we talked about the other day, the, because of the more mass with the head, heat expansion. Heat expansion causes choke. Causes the choke to expand uh, to a straight bore. Straight bore at operating temps. So we want to be very careful when we're operating our engines. Hey, you guys as mechanics, if you're working general aviation, I mean, you're going to be starting all kinds of dang engines. And you want to be very careful about starting an engine up and going to high power settings. Lawson just keeps shaking his head over there. <laughs> I know, because I already know I'm going to be lost when I read this later. And I'm going to be like, so upset. <laughs> I promise you, I'm going to be lost. Like, what does this go under? Two types of bores. <laughs> so you want to make sure the engine gets warmed up. I can show you where the number one is. <laughs> we had a pretty good go try. I went back and looked at that. It was all over here. I'm telling you, bro. It's pretty much <laughs> Yeah, at least five minutes. I know my airplane, you know, I, of course, I get the seatbelt set and then close the door and then I start it up and, you know, turn on the avionics and transfer my flight plan up to the panel and brief the passengers and piddle around. Yeah, I try to wait at least a good five minutes before I pull power up to... Uh, He's gonna change it. I'm gonna be completely blind. That's all right. I got you, bro. That's good. You can I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna watch the video and redo these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Uh, one of the things I do love about, like, I worked on some Remoses, and I'm interested to see what my new avionics will do. But they, um, the the yellow the line, the red line for the RPM changes with temperature. So it actually gives you red line. You can't go above a certain RPM until it warms up. And when the oil hits a certain temp or the cylinders, then the computer will move the red line to up to is full it, power. Is it like a, an electronic limiter? Like it just like no, you can go past it. Oh, but the that. the phys the red line on the digital display will move. That's cool. And so you just sit there and warm it up. At, it gives you an RPM. It's, it's fast. What's it's, it for? The Remos. Remos? Yeah, with the, with the Rotax in it. I don't remember. It's something like you warm it up at like 2,500 RPM. It's like this crazy RPM. Pass red line on my plane. There's warm up. And uh, like I said, I don't remember it offhand right now. But um, yeah, you just warm it up. And then when the red line moves, you're good to run it up. All right, this is three. I feel like you're focusing on the wrong part of the lecture, really. <laughs> well, it's hard to you can read through. You know, I mean, you read through this and like, oh, wait, that goes to this certain spot. So if you're reading it, you don't understand that. I could go back to circles and squares. And, you know, like, all right. Bore surface. It is honed. Honed to a specific finish. Uh, that finish is referred to as an RMS finish, which stands for root mean square. I know, I, I hated to do it to you. Um, it is measured with um, a profilometer. Which makes sense if you look at the word profile, profilometer. And this really doesn't measure it, but um, or a surface, surface roughness scale. Comparator block. It is honed to forty five degree um, cross hatch. Now that is a big deal, and I see a lot of people so honing. I'm going to say there's really, and I'm not going to write this uh, for two reasons. Number one, I don't have a specific point for it, which will cause Lawson to poo his pants even more. <laughs> so in the honing world, there's the bottle brush hone. You know what that looks like? It looks like a bottle brush. I know. It's, when you have a baby, you're going to have bottles, and you got to have the bottle brush, and it goes in. The big thing with the wire that sticks out of it. And yeah. Yeah, like big old yeah, what's pipe? Bottle brush. Oh, there you go. Perfect. That's it. Stick that in a drill, don't you? Yep. Stick it in a drill. It's got the little dingle, dingle ball. Dingle, a dingle ball. Yeah. All right. So that that'll hone it. Okay. And then there's the. Um, let me just look for solder hone. Where are those little balls made? There, these things. There's like that one. Maybe you can see that. Not promoting Amazon in any way, because uh, you know I'm a Walmart guy. So, um, all the way, I have Amazon stocks. So it's okay, you can. So um, that would go in there, and these have little um, abrasive rods, uh, stones on them. So the balls are made out of these blocks right here, but just they're balls. Um, and then you could have what some people call a power hone, or it's, you know, mine was the size of this table. It only did one cylinder at a time, kind of right here, which is crazy. And uh, it had a hydraulic ram that would cause a uh, cylinder to go up and down inside with stones all at it, and you'd press the stones out, which is pretty sweet. So it boards straight and true. Like this one's going to follow all the imperfections, really. So the bottle brush, even more so. Whatever imperfections you have, and out of round, it's just going to accentuate it. But the one I had, we would actually do like a four swipe with it, and then take it off and evaluate. And you could just see all the high spots, low spots, where the rings have been sitting, where they weren't sitting, and really evaluate it. 
So you have different kinds of homes when you do that. Obviously, only a very special shop is going to have the, uh, the big hone that sits on the floor, power hone, if you will. So a lot of people in the field, when they you know, want to change out rings, you are supposed to hone your cylinder when you change your rings. So what do they do? They get one of those ball hones or one of the other, other kind of hones, and they just kind of go at it with their drill. And I got to tell you, it's, it's harder than you think. I mean, it's real easy to stick it in there with a drill and just make it go. I mean, that's, that doesn't take any, any genius to it. Just put it in and pull the trigger, right? Uh, but to actually get a nice 45-degree crosshatch, so it's actually you got crosshatches running this way and they're running that way, and they're all at a 45-degree angle when you're just using a drill by hand with a ball. That takes some skill and practice. Uh, I, we, um, our big hone would not do Continental A65s. It's the smallest one they had. We just we did our RAM was too big to go in them. So in order to do these, we would actually use stuff that would go in a drill, and uh, or even the Sermonil cylinders. We had to do it with one of those um, ones that went into drill because they had the diamonds on them. So anyway, so what I did is I would practice, like I would take a cylinder and I would hone it on our power hone and then I would look at it and then I would practice doing it by hand until I could mimic that finish by hand. So it's something that I, I you know, it took me a while to work on that and actually get it right. Because if you don't and you got the, uh, and you just kind of stick it in, I can only imagine some people would, they just put it in, squeeze the trigger and just kind of go around like that. And I see it sometimes when you take cylinders off, it's really flat. So if it's, Number one, if it's too smooth, well, we go A. A, C. Uh-oh. I don't have an A on here? B. See, wait. Eight, nine, that's page 10. Yeah. Honed a 45-degree crosshatch. I don't have a number A here. Well, I'll have to make one for you. A. Uh, too smooth. <laughs> too smooth. <laughs> Will not hold oil. No, it's subbing under two, but my A is missing. So I have a B and a C, but I'll change it. So A, B, too rough, causes excessive wear, excessive wear. And of course, if you don't have the right 45, that's going to screw everything up too. I don't know what kind of damage that's going to do or what, it's just not going to break in well. So, so you don't want to make yourself an oil pump out of this thing. And let me see, I have a, I have a number four, I don't know why. Um, cylinder wear, oops. Cylinder wear is most near the head due to heat and pressure. Highest near the head due to heat and pressure. All right, so we talked about the cylinder barrel. And if you go back far enough, that was number five cylinder barrel. And there was no A, but there is a B. Or I could just make a circle. Well, the A that I put was high shine steel, which is what you put for I. Oh, okay. Four, go. Five, four, six, six, All right, here we go. Now it's just a circle. Good. Cylinder head. Nope. New subject. Okay. okay. We're talking about the cylinder head. Okay. I usually do. When people start bitching, I'll either stop writing altogether. <laughs> Or I just start doing that, and then I'll just do this. And you put, it wherever, you put it wherever the hell you want. I don't care. Yes, but some people are. And then sometimes I'm just going to go like that on every single one just to make a point. Number S. Number S. Number S. Number S. Made of aluminum. It is attached. To the barrel <laughs> made of aluminum. Attached to the barrel. How is it attached to the barrel? 
There's a shrink fit. The shrink fit could be bolted. Bolted um, flange. I want to say who did that? The radial in it. Radial engines on it's the five cylinder. Is that a Kenner? Kenner did that. Um, um, or three <coughs> threaded. Threaded. If it's yes, that is what you have. The threading is done at a high temp. At a high temp, about 650 degrees. That is the most common method. Most common method. Uh, when cylinders crack, and they will, it's not a matter of if, it's when, for the most part, you can send them to repair shops that are certified to do aluminum welding. Uh, they're certified yeah, repair station, repair cylinders by welding. And I'm pretty sure they unscrew them and do it because how else are you going to get down there with the TIG and weld that stuff? So they just undo it and weld them up. And it usually cracks right around the weld, but eh, it works for a while. Until it doesn't. Until it what does doesn't. it look like when they've been welded? What's that? What does it look like when they've been welded? When they've been welded? Like this. <laughs> it's, uh, you can just, well, that's got a big old crack in it. Jeez, I never noticed that. Anyway. <laughs> you. you don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> I just did. Visual method. Attached to barrel. Let me see. It contains, I'm going to go over here now. I'm running out of room. This is uh, number minus, um, contains, contains, what it contains, contains a lot of things, has a spark plug boss, while well, you complain, um, boss is actually, because there's two, they could be 14 millimeter or 18 millimeter, now isn't it kind of bizarro that if you even go all the way back to World War II, they were millimeters. Yeah. Yeah, it was just yeah, so the Europeans who are using millimeters were much better at making spark plugs. So we made our engines fit their spark plugs. It's the truth. That's what happened. Uh, spark plug bosses can come, let me see. Well, I'll write it. Brass or bronze bushing. Brass or bronze bushing. So it could be brands or bo brass or bronze bushing. Hey, look, this one has one of those. It has these big bushings that go in there. They're left-hand thread. So if I remember correctly, they're left-hand thread. Okay, so sometimes well, they'll unscrew. Anyway, sometimes they'll so it'll have to be regular thread. So sometimes they will unscrew with your spark plug. So that'll be regular thread. So you get the spark plug in there too tight, not using, if you're reusing your gaskets, which you shouldn't, gets in there too tight, spark plug seasons in the bushing, and you pull it out. Sometimes you pull the bushing right out with it. And it's not a big deal. I've changed out many, many of these. People come in like, what do I do? I'm like, yeah, just leave it here. So you take the bushing, you put it back in, and then if you look real careful, it's been drilled and pinned. So you just tighten it up and you drill and pin it in a different spot. So you just drill a, I don't know, it's about an eighth inch hole. It's like an eight, a eighth inch brass welding rod. You just pound it in there, grind it flush, you're done. That's all that holds it in. So that's the very old way of doing it. The new way of doing it is just using a helicoil. Helicoil. Where am I on? Helicoil. All right, for, for my new people, you haven't had the uh, last class, 300, so you haven't done helicoils. Chances are you're going to be doing a helicoil pretty soon, but a helicoil insert is just you take and you oversize the hole a special amount. It's not a standard thread. You sp and then you turn a spiral wound stainless steel spring in there, which now the threads are the stainless steel, and it's actually stronger than just having aluminum. Uh, so it's got contains, it contains the spark plug bosses, it has the valve guides, valve 
guides. Um, these are only changed when worn. You don't change them because you felt like it. We have the valve seats. Only changed when worn. Um, what else we have on here? Well, speaking of valve guides, so well, you guys have had all had a chance now to to do that. Change valve guides, valve seats, sort of. Um, we have the rocker arm bosses. Or I should say the rocker shaft boss, really. Yeah, that'd be a better rocker shaft. Rocker arm shaft bosses. <laughs> Just trying to help you out there. <coughs> there are airworthiness directives on this particular cylinder for thickness here. You have to measure those and do NDT whenever they're removed from an airplane. Although I've seen people remove them all the time and not do the AD. Don't know why. <coughs> got the intake port and we got the exhaust port exhaust port is identifiable because it has so it's smaller. nope it's keep guessing identifiable by greatest amount of cooling fins. Yep. Cooling fins. B, not this one. Big bore continentals. Um, big bore continentals. The spark plug. One spark plug. Spark plug points to exhaust. So it's angled. Um, it does two, have the number one spark plug? A, a one of the, not both of them, just oh. one of them. Oh. Uh, top. Uh, smaller diameter seat. Valve seat. Smaller diameter valve seat, but almost always a larger diameter stem. Very good. All right. Number six. Because there was a five. Now there could be a six. <coughs> Valves. Talk about the valves. Let's check my photos here. Anything I wanted to talk about specifically that I missed? Oh, there we go. Look at that. <coughs> We've got a lot of fins right there, so this must be the exhaust, exhaust side. Exhaust side has a s bigger, smaller. Smaller. Smaller head, but bigger stem. Bigger stem. <coughs> Up here is the rocker, yeah. rocker shaft, which goes in the rocker. Arm. No, it goes in rocker Arm. bushings. Arm. Yeah, Arm. yeah. Um, let's see. We've got um, two spark plug holes, either 14 or 18. very. Ver I think Franklin's the only one I've ever seen that does 14. Everybody else is 18. Um, Yeah, it's fine. Now we're talking about valves. Valves. Well, obviously they're used to open and close the ports. You could call them poppet valves. I don't. Ports, not valves. Oops.
And speaking of ports, you know, it's kind of a thing, the port and polish, or flow match cylinders. And there's some controversy on that. I don't know the actual answer to it, but I'll tell you what the controversies are. So people who are proponents of porting and polishing, what porting and polishing is, is they will actually have some sort of machine where they, f they flow it and they measure the air flowing through and they'll take away material until it flows just right in and out so that the cylinders are flow matched. And then they'll polish this. It's a very highly polished surface inside. The theory being that if it's not rough, it's polished, the air is going to go through smoother and quicker. And if you can do that, you're going to increase volumetric efficiency. Those against it say the roughness causes the air to be turbulent, which causes the fuel-air mixture to become better mixed, and so you have a, a better air mix fuel. Well, sense. The other thing they say is that, and I will attest to this one, these cylinders crack so easily in the exhaust side, especially light combing. You need a light combing cylinder, you got 700 hours, take it off, and all the way, oh, it's already cracked, so you know, what are you going to do? Um, if you take away material, you're weakening the cylinder, it's prone to cracking. All of those are valid. I'm going to tell you this one. You almost don't want to know this because people will hate you. All right. If I hold this up just right, and you can see, can you see the profile of the metal, not the fins, but underneath the fins? So you can see it, it actually, if you ignore the fins and look at the head, kind of goes like this. But all the fins, of course, well, are pretty straight. <laughs> so this looks like a flat surface. Guess what happens right here? Every freaking time. So once you know that, you can just walk by a small continental and just go, cylinder's broke. <laughs> and that one's broke. This one's got a nice crack in it. And it starts showing up just a little bit of an oil line. That's a crack. Sorry. Yeah. The flash line going through. Yes. <coughs> so you can see the crack. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's funny. Yeah, it's funny, but yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've walked in. I've like, oh, crap, I just saw that. I didn't, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it just ruined somebody's day. I did. The last. Uh, sorry, it's time to go. But.